Hey, good morning. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Brian. <laughs> Haven't been called Brother Dan in a long time. Um, I'm <laughs> Dan Barnard, one of the pastors here. If you don't know me, I'd love to meet you afterwards. But what we're doing, um, we're walking through right now the book of First Thessalonians, which has been an amazing book. I love how encouraging this book is, uh, how these guys have mostly got it right. It's good to see that. It's good to see some encouragement because a lot of what Paul's letters uh, end up going to churches are, hey, you're doing this wrong. So I like this. That said, we'll pick up in uh, chapter four today, but let's do a quick review of where we've been thus far. So it's a new church, lots of young believers in a Gentile region. Um, they were growing pretty quickly. They accepted the word. They knew persecution was coming with it. They were prepared with, for that, and they didn't care. They wanted to know Jesus. Paul cared for them very deeply. Um, he, he looked at them as his own children, and last week we saw that he loved them so much that he sent his protege, Timothy, to go and check in on them because he couldn't come himself pretty high praise for this church that he wanted someone so important to him to go and check on them. So with that very brief introduction, let's pray and let's dive into the word. Lord God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to open your word and to hear from you. Thank you that you speak to each and every one of us so clearly, so often, and uh, that you give us this word that we can hold on to. Lord, I pray that you'd open our hearts to hear from you this morning, that you'd use me as your tool, and that we go from here loving you more than we did when we came. Amen. So I'll give you a moment. Let's dive in, starting in verse 1 of chapter 4. Paul says, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you're doing, that you do so more and more. Okay, we're going to camp on this verse for a bit. So Paul begins the very, this, this section here, and he says, finally. That doesn't mean he's done with the letter. There's still quite a bit after this. What it means is he's, he's kind of wrapping up the letter for them, and he's shifting, as he does in a lot of his letters, from the theological, the theoretical, to the practical. How do you live this out? He says, finally, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus. Ask and urge. So it's not just a simple request. Hey, could you do this, please? It's a fervent exhortation. It means he really wants us to pay attention to what he's going to say here. And not just that, not just listen to what he says, but do what he says. He wants to ensure that the audience really understands this isn't just from him. He's asking them as fellow believers in Christ. He says, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus. Do this. And he says that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you're doing, that you do it more and more. So he's telling him, hey, we told you how to live in light of being saved. In light of knowing Christ, of being transformed by the renewing of your minds. Of that transition from death to life. You know this stuff and you're doing it. That's awesome. So much better than his, Paul, than his letter to the first Corinthians, or in first and second Corinthians, where he has to handle some rough stuff going on in those churches. He says, great job. Keep doing it more and more. The thought is, don't let up on the gas. Don't fail on the follow-through. Keep running hard for Christ. He puts it this way when he talks to the, first Corinth or to the Corinthian church. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize so that you may obtain, uh, so run that you may obtain it? You know, the issue with the Christian life is not starting well. It's finishing well. 
Now, starting is extremely important because you can't finish if you haven't started. So let's, let me maybe rephrase that. Unless you understand that you are a sinner, unless you understand that you need a Savior, unless you understand that the only Savior is God, become flesh, living the life that you couldn't live perfectly in your place, dying the death you deserved and paying the debt for your sin. Unless you understand that and accept his free gift of eternal life, well, you can't finish it all in the Christian life, can you? But so many people start out unbelievably on fire for God when they're first saved. Think about that. Do you remember when you first got saved? Do you remember friends that that first came to Christ and how excited they were to share the gospel with everyone they met? How they went home and they shared with their families, even if their families laughed at them or said, want nothing to do with that, stop talking about it. They said, but you need to know. Rightly so. Who wouldn't want to share what God had done for them so shortly after gaining eternal life? It's an amazing thing, and it's something we should want to share. But for many people, that fire dies down slowly through the years. As the cares of the world grow up and strangle the joy of our first love. Jesus puts it this way. Matthew 13. You know this parable. He says, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what's been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is he who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, another sixty, and another thirty. So Jesus acknowledges that in many cases what starts out strong never gets to the point of producing fruit. Never gets to that stage. Why? Well, whether Satan strips it away and the sin keeps it from taking root in the first place, whether trials come and the lack of a strong root system prevent growth, or whether the cares and worries of health, wealth, prosperity come in and choke it out. It's really easy to give up, to take our foot off the gas, to remain fruitless in the gospel. And what Paul is encouraging the church here is that he wants them to keep running hard. Hold on to that joy, that that love of Christ. Keep doing what he taught them about living for Christ. He urges them not to become content or complacent in their obedience. Why? Same reason the farmer only stops weeding his field when the plants are grown big enough that they aren't choked out by what's growing around them. He wants them to grow into mature men and women of Christ. Okay, we got through one verse. Verse 2. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. So Paul says, hey, I've already told you this. You know this stuff. You've got this, but it bears repeating. Just like every time I stand up here, I preach the gospel. I talk about repentance from dead works to life in Christ. Why do I do that? Because we need to be reminded often, probably every day, of who our Lord is, what he's done for us, and how much we need him. It bears repeating, not by way of reproof or correction. He's not saying you're doing a bad job and you need to be reminded of this. He's saying you're doing a good job and you need to be reminded of this. What does, he, what does he want to address here, though? What, what specific thing is he looking at? Well, verse 3 gives us an idea. It says this. 
For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Well, guys, you want to know what God wants from us? Here's a good hint. When it says this is the will of God, that should let you know that this is the will of God. This is what God really wants. The very will of God Almighty is for your sanctification. You're being set apart, your purity, your holiness, that you would be made more and more holy. And how in this case specifically? In terms of sexuality. Seems like a little bit of a non sequitur, right? Why'd, why'd Paul go there? Well, we know that in at least one of the early churches, namely the Corinthian church, it was an issue that had some broad implications and some broad effect and was hurting the people there because they didn't have this area under control. Paul also knew a couple things. Number one, he knew that this specific sin drags people away from following God's plan very quickly and very severely. And secondly, he knew that in that time, the Gentile cultures had a very different view of what was permissible sexually. They were a culture that was steeped in horrendous practices. They said, you know, adultery and premarital sex were just fine, so long as it was with prostitutes or slaves, and as long as you weren't too high a class, and as long as you didn't get caught. But Paul calls on the Thessalonians to better represent Christ, not the world around them. And what a call that is in our culture. Where, yeah, we might not have cult prostitutes running around, but in our culture, the internet has made the same kind of lust available in everyone's pocket. So he says this in verse 4, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Holiness and honor. So Paul expects people to be able to control their urges, to be able to control their proclivities, their preferences, their identities, and to do so in holiness. What does that mean? Pertaining to the character of God. It means to be perfect. Well, how can we do that? We're not perfect. But these people he's talking to are believers. They have the Holy Spirit of God inside them, so they've been given the power to live in light of that. And he says, control his own body in holiness and honor. To honor God as the designer, the creator of sexuality. Guys, God created sexuality as a gift to be enjoyed in the proper context. Right? A lot of people today have a problem with that. They decide they want to make the rules about this. But if God is the one who created sexuality, doesn't he get to make the rules about how it's supposed to work? If he created everything, doesn't he get to make the rules about how this is supposed to work? A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people don't want to hear that they have to follow someone else's rules. But I got a question. A lot of you have been to my house. I've been to a lot of your houses. When you go to someone else's house, whose rules do you follow while you're there? If I come to your house, where should I use the restroom? In the designated spot or wherever I feel like? May I punch holes in the wall because I don't like that wall and I think there needs to be a hole there? Of course not. You wouldn't invite me back. And if you did, well, that's a lot of grace you're extending. But the point is, you understand this. Everyone understands this intrinsically. If you own the house, you make the rules. In our house, do you take the shoes off or not? We've got five kids. We don't care. You might want to keep your shoes on so you don't get Legos in the bottom of your foot, <laughs> right? But if God created this universe, he gets to make the rules. So it's not unreasonable to say that the one who created everything 
gets to make the rules about how it should work, right? What I mean is this. It's not lost on me that two days ago, well, we're talking right now about honoring God with our sexuality, but we just spent an entire month, I shouldn't say we, our country, and all sorts of corporations spent an entire month flying a rainbow flag and, and celebrating sinful, abhorrent practices that defy God at every step. And for me to say that means I'll be called a bigot, I'll be called a homophobe, a transphobe, it, I, it, this will be called hate speech. Brothers and sisters, I don't hate anyone. I want them to know the true joy of knowing Jesus Christ. I want them to see their need for a Savior. We've wasted so much time as a church in America trying to avoid confrontation, trying to avoid being called judgmental, trying to not hurt anyone's feelings. But when we, what we're really doing when we refuse it to lovingly call sinners to repentance and obedience to our Lord is to tell them that on one hand, we don't really believe what we say, and on the other hand, we love our own temporary comfort more than we love sinners who will be damned to hell forever unless they know the risen Christ and turn from their sin. It is so much more hateful to go through life ignoring the people around us who are lost, who are hell-bound, and maybe they'd listen if we would just share the gospel. Maybe God could use you and me to reach them with this message of hope and love and forgiveness. I think about it this way. If you're driving, and I stand in the middle of the road, and I inconvenience you and say, hey, don't go this way. There's a bridge out. There's a detour here. It, it's, it, yeah, it's not the way you want it to go, but it's the right way to go, and it'll keep you from flying off this bridge. Am I being hateful? If I sit at the bottom of the hill and I flag you down and say, hey, stop speeding. There's a cop sitting up there behind a tree. He's going to ticket you. And you say, I'm going to go as fast as I want. Okay. I'm not being hateful by pointing out the rules. I'm not being hateful by telling you there's something coming. Just like when I tell you hell is coming. If you don't know Christ, you're already condemned is what Christ says in John 3. But he came that you could have life. Don't you want life? Continue on in verse 5. Paul says this. We're to live in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Brothers and sisters, we should not, we cannot mimic this world. We should look different. We should look crazy to these people, but why? Because we know Jesus. Because the creator of everything died for you and I. To have a relationship with us and not only died but rose again. He didn't stay dead. Here Paul reminds us that those who don't know Jesus are slaves to sin. They're living their lives in the passion of lust, completely controlled by their sinful flesh rather than by the Spirit of God. Now this verse might seem a bit confusing in the way it's phrased because Paul's writing to a Gentile church, right? But when he says, like the Gentiles who do not know God, he separates them from this church. They're ethnically Gentiles, but spiritually they're part of God's chosen people. Paul writes to another Gentile church in the same vein in Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8. He says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. He says, don't be deceived. God's not mocked. We get this contrast here that Paul is trying to make it abundantly clear. There's no middle ground. 
There's no compromise with this world. This world wants you pulled away from God. So I'm a banker, and, and I deal with fraud a whole lot. And I deal with wonderful people who are so misled by someone who calls them and says, yeah, we've got a special deal for you. The number of people, and it's the most vulnerable people, and it's so heartbreaking for me to see because I can look them in the eye and say, please, block this person who's trying to talk to you. They are trying to steal from you. They're trying to rob you of everything that you've got. And, and you don't need to be kind to them. You need to stop talking to them because every word you say to them gives them another in, another way to pull you away had one lady who deposited a $37,000 check into her account and was going to wire it out the next day. Okay, I don't know if you know anything about bank wires, but once a wire is gone, it's gone. There is nothing you can do. You might as well have handed someone a stack of hundreds and said, see you later. We stopped it. Why do we stop it? Because we asked some questions and figured out, well, this is... Uh, Kenny Chesney was DMing her, was sending her messengers on Instagram. The Kenny Chesney? Yes, the Kenny Chesney. And his evil manager had captured him, and he sent this check from someone else to be able to buy him out of slavery from his evil manager so they could ride off in the sunset together. And I said, ma'am, not to be unkind, but Kenny, Kenny Chesney's worth tens of millions of dollars and has his pick of basically any woman on the planet and you ain't it. But she so wanted to believe that this was right and good and she was going to get this money and she was going to have everything taken care of. And that's what the world does to us over and over and over. And that's what it does to the lost over and over. It promises so much that it can never fulfill promises so much it can never fulfill. But, but in Christ, we have true fulfillment. So don't be deceived. God's not mocked. What you do, if you reap to the flesh, you reap corruption, but if you reap to the Spirit, if you sow to the Spirit, you'll from the Spirit reap eternal life. In verse 6, Paul says this, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. What this is talking about, Paul is addressing the idea of adultery. The Jews would have understood that as wrong and sinful. The Gentiles had a much more lenient attitude toward it. So in some cases, adultery was punishable by, it was a punishable offense, but a lot of times it went unpunished. Paul reminded the church that no sin is secret. Even if there aren't earthly or worldly consequences, even if God doesn't handle people in the here and now, one day we'll all stand before the judgment throne of God, where every sin will be laid bare before his holiness. Verse 470 says, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. God has not called us to be like the world. Elsewhere, he calls us to shine like lights in the darkness in this world. Philippians, another letter that Paul wrote to another church in a Gentile setting, says this, Chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, Do all things without grumbling or complaining or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. He's not called us to be like the world. We're to shine. We are to be visible in one sense, because of the way we don't act like the people in this world. So a couple questions about that. 
And this is not to make you feel bad. This is a question I need to ask myself every single day. Are you shining the light of Christ? How do the people around you see you? How is your life different? You know, C.S. Lewis said that the problem with a lot of Christians is, is they convince themselves that the only difference in their life should be that they tithe a little more and they swear a little less. Where is your life blatantly different from the people around you? How do your neighbors, co-workers, strangers see the goodness of God and his mark of salvation on you? Do they? If so, as Paul said, keep up the good work. Don't let up. But if not, take heed. Listen to what Paul says in verse 4, 8. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man but God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So brothers and sisters, loved by God and called according to his word, Paul tells the Thessalonians that if they ignore his exhortation here, they're not just ignoring him. They're ignoring the very gift of the Holy Spirit. They're turning back they're turning their backs on the very God that they claim to love and serve. Let's make sure we're not doing that. Then he shifts a little bit. In verse 9, he says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write for you, to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. It's nice having four boys running around because you can see this in action. In regards to phileo, brotherly love, the love of friendship, the love of family, which the new Christian church so closely resembled, Paul says, you don't need me to write you on this. You guys have got this one. You're doing exactly what you should. God taught you how to love one another. You're doing exactly what he wants here. Great work. In, in 410, he says, for that indeed is what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Again, great job. You guys have got it. And I can say in this church, at Eagle Creek Community Church, I think we've got this one. I love seeing it. Remember what Jesus said in John 13, 35. He said, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So he once again urges them. He strongly exhorts them. Not just if you would, if you could, if you got time. He says, no, do this. Keep growing in this. Concentrate on this. This is what God wants from you. He wraps up the chapter like this. He says, well, this section like this. And to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Now, wait a minute. Didn't we just talk about shining out? Notice what he's saying here. He says, live a peaceful life. Don't get involved in other people's business. Work hard. Don't expect others to pick up the slack to take care of you. You work hard and take care of yourselves so that you can be a blessing to those around you rather than a drain. In essence, if we're to be examples of Christ's love for the world, how could we then hypocritically live as narcissistic, demanding, lazy busybodies? It's like Paul knew that TikTok would be a thing 2,000 years before it existed. So in summation... In summation, uh, one more slide, sorry. Keep growing in Christ. Keep growing in Christ. You guys are doing well. Keep learning more. Keep letting the Holy Spirit have more and more control. 
Keep emulating what Christ did. Keep loving the people around you. Keep sharing the gospel and bringing them into a saving knowledge of Jesus. Keep doing the good works that he saved you to complete. Secondly, don't grow complacent. Complacency is one of the things that is disastrous for the Christian life. It's a lazy man's rebellion. You're either growing or you're stagnant. There's no in-between. There's no middle ground. Third, don't buy into the world's deception. God's ways are always better than the world's. If not here and now, then certainly in the hereafter. So what Paul urges the Thessalonians, and by extension us to do, is control yourself. Look different and look for ways to share his love everywhere we go. And finally, we as believers should absolutely look different. Not because of what we demand from others, but because of the way we reflect our Savior in what he gave to us. So keep up the good work and don't take your foot off the gas. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for loving us while we were yet sinners, for dying for us, for saving us when we could not save ourselves. Thank you for the truth of the gospel, that while we were slaves to sin, by believing in you, we have the imputed righteousness of Christ placed on us. That when you look at us now, if we know your son, you don't see our sin, you see Jesus. I think that song we, we sang, All Sufficient Merit, is found in Christ alone. And we thank you. We thank you, we thank you. Because we could not earn what you gave us. So, Lord, help us to live our lives in light of that fact. Help us to live lives that are counter to the world around us in that we love and truly love, not for our own purposes, but for yours. Not for our own purposes, but for those who are dying of sin and living in darkness. Help us to be that great light. Help us to reflect to you well. Lord, we love you, we praise you, and we need you to do this as we can't on our own. So thank you for saving us, for empowering us, and for the gift of the Holy Spirit through which we can do this. It's in your name we pray. Amen.